if the ruling stays on the new government lane mandating health insurance, companies are going to begin not hiring employees full-time in their company. They're going to outsource it. They're going to say, I have a full-time staff, mm -hmm. but I them. I will not pay because they're going to say the cost of providing insurance is going to be so extreme and such a burden yeah. on my business, I will put that burden back on the employee. This is going to create, so listen to me right now, this is going to create a shift in the way we work in our economy in this country. If we continue, now I don't know where we're going to come out on the final ruling on this, but you have to look at things like this and say, if this stands, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. If it stands as it is, it requires a necessity of becoming an entrepreneur because probably the only way you'll have a full-time job is if you outsource and say, I will work for you, understanding that I will be responsible right. for my own medical Well, that's the also support. a little bit, I mean, I'm reaching here, but it's, you know, for any of you who have read the What Color Is Your Parachute, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the things that is encouraged is to go do your own thing and get paid for it as a self-confidence boost. And this is actually one of four ways that, again, one of these studies that's really great that's locked up in academia says that women and girls can increase their self-confidence. So one of them is actually doing the thing, okay, OTJ training. Um, and what color is your parachute picks up on that. Another one is um, exposure to mentors and role models. And then another one is reading about mentors and role models, even in the form of case studies which is, you know, you can guess where we came in there. And um, so these are all things that you can do to increase your self-confidence and what self-efficacy is basically the thought, you know, like Rosie the Riveter, I can do it. It's that self-efficacy. It's not just, oh, I feel good about myself or I believe in myself. It's, I think I can do this. It's very action-oriented. And women and girls in an entrepreneurial study have lower self-efficacy than males. And, and, you know, nobody knows why. I mean, it would be good cocktail chatter. There's a lot of stuff people still don't know. But here's the problem with that. So you say, oh, that's too bad. That's an interesting data point. Here's the problem with that, is that when women and girls have lower self-efficacy, we limit our options. So it's like the horses that have the thing on, you know, the blinders or whatever, so you don't have any peripheral vision. That's what we do. And so when they talk about women in tech or, oh, there's not enough women in this area and there's not enough women in that area, I always go to the areas. I go to the areas where we could increase self-efficacy instead of, like, kind of whining about it a lot, you know? I say, what can I really do to be a role model in this area or to find a role model for my daughter or my sister or my niece or my students in this area? Because then I can be part of the solution. Instead of waving the flag saying, there aren't enough women in tech. Like, that, that's good, but it only calls attention to the problem. And a big thing that's missing, which is why the Hot Mamas Project and our seminars got started, is because there are not a lot of clear solutions to the problem. So we know self-efficacy and self-confidence is a problem for women and girls. And then it's like, okay, so then what? Right? If any of you had to go out and say, well, you know, geez, I really want to be part of that solution to raise self-efficacy and self-confidence, what would you do? Like, what's the book? <laughs> on raising your self-confidence and self-efficacy. What's this class on ra raising your confidence and self-efficacy? I don't know one, and I like work in this area, aside from my class, which is you know so limited at GW, which is why we started doing these outside seminars, so that you can walk out and take that to the bank and say, I have increased self-confidence. I have increased self-efficacy. I know how I can pass that on by being a role model or showing girls and women in my life, and even myself, how to check out new areas, or be a role model, or a mentor. I think that that's a really good good point. And I'm no matter what, even today, I'll, I'll like I'll realize that I have anchored a belief system on something false, and I've owned it. And then I'll go, wait a minute, that's that's not true. And I think that it's really true. We create yeah. our own mini reality. But yeah. I want to talk about passing on knowledge and community. And we have a guessing on Frederick back there. And somebody had asked her, which is really interesting when you talk about community mm -hmm. and why we're verbal and all of these other things. Women are storytellers. We are natural storytellers. Yeah, all you got to do is hang out with my mother-in-law for a while to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to you, Flossie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we pass through our stories the knowledge inherent. Right. And that's why it's so important. And she had said, you know, she came to last month's CEO chit chat, and she goes, I asked I've heard books in the city. Tell me what it is. She said, it's The Red Tent. And The Red Tent mm. is this fabulous book that I'm just about finished reading. I've read it so 
because I've relished every single word in the book. It's so interesting. But it talks about, going back to the time, ancient Egypt, about living in the desert, how women um, living in a tent who would go in every month and have uh, a week's mm -hmm. time off. And during that time, it was the community of talking and the passing on the stories, mm -hmm. which were so important. And I think that that's why what we're doing, it's the stories. It is the stories that are interesting, compelling, and fast, because we'll read those right. stories and that's knowledge that we pass on. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because last year, number one, love the red tent. And whenever I'm feeling sorry for myself, <laughs> I think about the red tent and how I don't have it so bad. <laughs> because, you know, those women are like hoofing it out in the desert, okay? So the, the, the second thing is, um, yes, the concept of story is very old school, okay? It's very old school. And we're kind of, are we losing it? Or not. To me, the jury is still out. We have all these great social media tools, but at the same time, it's devoid of culture, a little bit. Like so, the jury is still out for me on this. And last year, we had a judge who was a leader in the Native American community, and I'm starting to do research in this area um, and with other cultures that have a very strong oral history, um, are, are known for having very strong oral history um, cultures. And so, and looking into that, and what makes that successful? Because there's some things we're never going to reinvent. And it's still going to be about that. It's still going to be about why are we so compelled by that? Why are people crazy on Ancestry.com? Finding, you know what I mean? This is, this is like a basic human need that I think pops up in weird ways in our culture. Like, I actually have this hypothesis about books and that they provide a community for people that don't have a community you know like the more techie and entrepreneurial and single like solopreneurial we get I mean you know so Starbucks had to close a lot of locations right during the recession and some tough economic times but I think part of their initial growth and success is tapping into this thing and we can't quite figure it out. We think it's just coffee. But I actually think it's more than that. And it's there for us and we're attracted to it and we can't quite figure out why. And I think that's a big part of it. And it's a community that's about also no expectations of you. Okay? So you walk in, you get your coffee, you may see somebody, you may not. But nobody's sitting there with expectations of you in this community. This is also what happens with experience sharing and storytelling. There's no expectation of you. You're listening, you're learning, you're taking away what you want. It's not anybody sitting there saying you should and you should and this and that. And in our Hot Mamas research, we did years ago with about 270 working women in depth, just in the US though, I will say we had like, um, so I can't say it reflects international perspectives. The number one just massive killer of women, not literally killer, but you know, buzzkill, I should say, <laughs> is expectations. And it was an open-ended question. So we're not saying, hey, what challenges do you face? Expectations, work-life balance, da da da. It was not multiple choice. It was an open-ended question where we said, what is the number one challenge you face? In a million different ways, women said expectations. It's expectations of themselves. It's expectations from others, circling back to the work and the spouse thing, okay? Like logging the most hours. And, and so this is what we have to recognize and also do something to set ourselves up in situations where we have fewer expectations of ourselves and that others can have fewer expectations of us. And it is amazing how free you can be mentally. And there's just a couple quick tricks that I actually teach in my class, I mean, which I could go through. One is the to don't list. It's stuff that you find racing through your mind, like walking through the house, and oh, there, and there's a dust ball, and there's a, and I need to, and nope. If it's on the to don't list, you're making a commitment to yourself to not pay attention to that. And so, of course, what's on the to do list? It should really be your top three priorities that you really want to accomplish. This is a little bit more complicated that we work through in my seminar, but just that's the basics. Um, so that's number one. 
expectations at home or expectations with others in your life can be very complicated. Um, it's always nice to sit down with somebody who's been very good at working within their relationships to calibrate expectations. But you do think that women enter into negotiations less. I think we're bad at negotiations. Well, How many women feel like they're good at negotiations? Oh, good. Okay, we've got a couple. Yeah. My yeah. husband will not take me to buy a car because he said, I'm so bitter. Before a guy comes in and says, hello, I'm acting like he's going to pull a gun on me. Yeah. I mean, he says, you are not going to walk into the I mean, because I already feel under prepared. Like no one like me. I just feel like he's going to rip me off, and I don't know if he's ripping me off. Yeah. I, and I hate that. I mean, it really makes, I'm angry talking about it right now. I know. Anybody here work at a car dealership, well, car, leave. Car things <laughs> are notorious um, with women. It's actually mm -hmm. one of the examples I give, you know, because women have 80 to 85% of household purchasing power. So whether you work, whether you don't, women are controlling the first strings her strings in the households across America. So that's why I view some of the behaviors like that in car dealerships and stuff so humorous. And I also view it as funny then when, you know, women judge each other um, because we all have such incredible power, you know. And so I don't really think even we're in a position to judge as we're in this sort of formative phase of what's the new definition of success going to be. Oh, we that's a great question. We don't know. That? You know what I mean? But the second thing I just want to say, because this feel like this really will be helpful if, with, with women limiting their expectations of themselves and helping um, calibrate expectations of others is for yourself, the to don't list. There's lots of other stuff, but that's like one tool. And then for others, just recognize that women, uh, men enter into negotiations two to three times more often than women, okay? So sit, you know when guys kind of talk smack to each other, you know, during um, games and stuff, and they're like, dude, you suck. You know, you're a <laughs> blank, fill in the blank, you know, whatever. <laughs> and this is just common banter. So, so I think that it's, it's easing into the negotiation behavior, which is like, I can sort of say some mildly unpleasant things to you, which you may not like, but we all kind of have an understanding that it's cool in the end. Women don't <laughs> operate that way. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, we're not like sitting there saying, oh, you suck, you know, those <laughs> shoes suck. You know, like, I mean, you might be crushed if somebody told you your shoes suck. Oh, my gosh, I know. <laughs> I couldn't get out of bed for a week. W, right. Yeah. And so, um, so I think what we need to do is just recognize that. And I usually will recommend that women form a backbone for negotiations in the form of a spreadsheet. <laughs> and literally write down, <clears throat> here's what I want. Here's what I will do. Here's what I won't do. And then use that as the basis for negotiation. So like, I'll have students do this. You can use it at home, though, too. I did this with my husband one time regarding like house tasks and stuff. And I'm just like, this, this is not happening. I said, we can switch some things, but you don't get to add things on my list because I got no big. So you choose. What are we doing? What are we swapping around? And all of a sudden, I had to find the playing field. So that was great. And then my students who are going into salary negotiations, um, I have them write down, oh, here's everything I did. Here's the quantitative value of it. Here are the things that I want in my promotion. And they'll sit down across from their boss, and they'll have the spreadsheet. And the boss will say, well, how about you know 15% and we'll take on your benefits? And they'll look at their spreadsheet, and they're like, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. But I can do this. You know, like, where did this come from? You know what I mean? Like, but all of a sudden, it's this rule. And they're defining their own playing field. And I found that it's like a psychological trick to give yourself some power and a backbone if you feel like, oh, well, OK, I'll just wimp out of this one. You know, you, you commit to it. And you say, this is what I want. We can swap things around within this. But this is all I got. Only five things are getting on the list here. 